So the first uh, speaker today is Fernando Aldai. Um, <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, I would like to, I don't know how this will work, but I would like to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me here. It's my first conference in, um, in person in a long time, so I am very hyped about this. Um, so I will uh, change gears with respect to the previous presentation. And today we will be talking about conformal field theory techniques to study string theory or M-theory scattering amplitudes on EDS. And I was told to use the mouse as a pointer uh, so that people um, away can see as well. Uh, this is um, a talk based on this uh, set of papers with a few collaborators. And the basic organization is that in the first part of the talk, I will discuss the scattering of gravitons or closed strings, and we will introduce the main techniques. And then we will settle the ground for uh, discussing also the scattering of gluons or um, open strings. And please stop me at any time. I, I, I will try to, I, I will be on time, but um, we will see how it works. So the scattering amplitude is basically, in this case, a four point scattering amplitude is the probability that two particles colliding with momenta P1 and P2 result into two other particles with momenta P3 and P4. The scattering amplitude uh, denoted by A can depend on many things. It depends on which particles you are scattering, their masses, charges, etc. The parameters of your theory denoted collectively with G the momenta of the and the momenta of the particles being scattered through these Mandelstam variables S, T, and U. Uh, there are many reasons to study uh, scattering amplitudes. So first, as physicists, we should be interested in them because they allow to test the predictions of our theory. But from a more abstract point of view, they can also teach us a lot about the structures and symmetries of a theory and things that are not at all clear from just looking at the Lagrangian of the theory, they may be apparent once you start computing scattering amplitudes. And a theory we would like to understand is a string theory. So we will look at a string theory a scattering amplitudes. A string theory scattering amplitudes, as we all know, uh, they organize in a genus expansion. If you expand uh, in powers of the string coupling constant, so you have some three level or genus zero contribution, genus one, genus two, etc. And one of the first results in a string theory is the amplitude at three level and in flat space. This is the, the so-called Virasoro Shapiro amplitude. And it's this very nice function of alpha prime and the, and the Mandelstam variables, S, T, and U. It is uh, illuminating to take that expression and to expand it in powers of alpha prime. And if you do that, you see that the leading term is the supergravity amplitude, one over S, T, U, followed by an infinite tower of stringy corrections. And this structure uh, mimics very much the structure of the low energy effective action, where this corresponds to the supergravity effective action. Here you have R to the four, D four R to the four, etc. But being that the amplitude is an unshared quantity, sometimes it's much easier to, to calculate, to compute, etc. So the question we would like to answer is what can we say about a string theory, a scattering amplitudes on anti uh, space? Any questions so far? Okay. So the basic strategy will be to use the EDS-CFT duality and to map a scattering amplitude in EDS to correlators of local operators in the dual conformal field theory at the boundary. Now, when you compute the scattering amplitudes, uh, you have to define asymptotic states but this is not very easy in EDS because EDS is like a box, so you cannot go infinitely far. But the EDS CFT tells you that if you want to compute a scattering amplitude in EDS, what you have to do is to compute a correlator of local operators 
at the boundary. I don't know if the sound works well, but I, I will just keep talking. Um, yeah. <laughs> And so if we want to compute the amplitude of four points, as shown here, this maps to this four point correlator at the boundary. In this talk, we will focus in the usual example of a strings on, on uh, ADS5 uh, crosses five. And uh, is that okay? Uh, okay. <laughs> and this maps a string theory on ADS5 crosses five to four dimensional N equals four super Yanni Mills. In this side, we have two parameters, the string coupling constant and the radius of ADS or S5 in alpha prime units. And in this side, we have N and the Jan Mills coupling constant. And the ADS CFT duality provides us with a dictionary for the parameters on both sides, where GS goes like one over N and R square in units of alpha prime is mapped to the tough coupling uh, square root of lambda. So because of that, we see that the genus expansion on the string expansion maps to the one over n expansion in the CFT side, while stringy corrections, corrections that were, uh, went with positive powers of alpha prime, map to one over lambda corrections. On the other hand, we would like to scatter gravitons. And we see that in ADS CFT, gravitons on ADS map to uh, a protected scalar operator of dimension two, which lives in the stress tensor multiplet. This is the simplest operator of n equals four super Yanni Mills. But in addition, because we have the S5, we have also, as you compactify, you have a kalusa klein tower of gravitons or massive gravitons in a DS, and those map to a tower of scalar operators of dimension K. When k is equal to two, you get the massless uh, case, which, which is this um, O2. So our aim is to compute these general correlator functions, O, k1, k2, k3, k4, in a one over n and in a one over lambda expansion. So let me uh, tell you a, a, a few details about n equals four super Yanni Mills that will be important in what follows. First, we have the superconformal symmetry, which is PSU 2,2 slash 4, and that has as a bosonic subgroup conformal symmetry in four dimensions, SO2,4, and R symmetry, which is SO6. And the operators we would consider, which are the operators OK that I introduced before, are operators in the symmetric traces representation of this SO6. So these indices are in the symmetric traceless, and these i's run from one to six. Not to have to bother with all these indices, it is very convenient to take a six dimensional null vector, which I denoted by y, and then to contract all these indices with y in this way uh, here. So we have this okay that depends on x and y. And we want to consider four point correlator of, of, this, uh, of this operator. Oh, sorry, I, I, I'm not, thank you. Thank you so much. The bosonic symmetry implies some constraints. And in that actually tell us that this four point correlator up to a prefactor is a function of the cross ratios, two cross ratios U and B for a space time and two are symmetry cross ratios that I denote by sigma and tau. Uh, you can uh, see that in sigma and tau, this correlator is simply a degree k polynomial in this uh, two variable sigma and tau. They are symmetry cross ratios. Well, in general, it's a complete nightmare and mess with respect to U and B. So the U and B dependence is, is nasty. Um, on the other hand, we have also the fermionic part of the subgroup, of the, of the supergroup, and that implies superconformal word identities compute, considered by Dolan and Osborne ages ago. And what they imply is this very nice set of linear constraints on the correlators. So we have this, 
where it is convenient to introduce a set of, of um, cross ratios, set set bar in a space time, and alpha alpha bar in R symmetry. So we would like to focus in genus zero amplitudes, which are the easiest ones, but already highly non-trivial. And genus zero amplitudes, they correspond to the leading non-trivial term in a one over n expansion. So you get your correlator, you start expanding it in one over n, and the first term here is the, the genus zero uh, expansion. In addition, if you take the limit where lambda is large and you drop all one over lambda corrections, then this gives the correlator in the supergravity approximation. And this will be the aim of this talk. That is what we want to compute. There is actually a very simple recipe to compute that. And, and people have been trying to do that for over 20 years or, or maybe more. 20 years before COVID, I, the last two years didn't happen. Um, so the, the, the standard recipe is that you start from the 10 dimensional supergravity effective action, a term of the action that I shown you, and then you perform a Calusa claim reduction on the S5. This is very nice because this gives us an effective action on EDS5, and this effective action will have some cubic couplings and quartic couplings, and uh, then you can read off uh, those couplings from these uh, vertices. The third step is to write down all exchange and contact with the diagrams, shown uh, like this, and then you need to compute the diagrams, and that's it. So you are done. Actually, this is not perhaps the best idea, and there is a few uh, obstacles in doing this. So the first problem is that the effective action is extremely hard to compute. So even for the simplest case of ADS, ADS CFT, which is ADS 5 cross S5, the action takes 15 pages. So this was taken from a paper of Aryutunov and Frollo, and, and it looks, uh, it is exactly like this. So th this is uh, it's all true. Um, but then if you start writing down the Witten diagrams, you have a huge amount of Witten diagrams that you can, you can write down. So given K1, K2, K3, and K4, the diagrams grow basically like the product of all these things. And you can imagine that if you want to compute K equals 20, et cetera, it's just super difficult. But even if you did that, they are extremely hard to compute. So you would have to compute 20,000 with 10 diagrams, and that would be uh, very hard. Now, it has to be said that after a heroic progress, by Aryutunov, Frolov, Dolan, Ospon, Sokachev, and other people, many correlators were computed for ADS-5 cross S5. And, and that was amazing, and it took 20 years, and people was doing that, and, and it was a nice story. But then, even if you are happy with this, it is completely hopeless for other cases that we would like to study. So for instance, for cases like ADS-7 cross S4, or ADS-4 cross S7, we don't even have this effective action uh, at hand. So there is clear something else uh, that, that we are missing. And the issue is that there is no clear understanding of the organizing underlying organizing principles. And we definitely need a better way to proceed. Are there any questions? There you go. So first, the first idea is to use the right language. And the right language is uh, Melina space. You could have asked me uh, already why, how it comes that a scattering amplitude, which is a function of three Mandelstam variables, ST and U, maps to something 
that is a function of x1, x2, x3, x4, or two cross ratios? And the answer is that given a correlator, you can define the correlator in Melina space, which I denote by this M. Here is some prefactor of gamma functions. This is something very similar to a Melin, uh, sorry, to a Fourier transform, or it's like an actually like an inverse Melin transform. And this object here is what we define as the string amplitude in a DS phi cross S phi. And this depends on three uh, variables, Melin variables that are very similar to the Mandelstam variables, ST and U, with one linear constraint given here. And now uh, this Melin amplitude is actually very nice because it is a meromorphic function with very nice properties. And um, the properties, so it behaves as an amplitude basically, and the properties are that it behaves very nicely under crossing symmetry. Then if you have the exchange of operators, then this leads to simple poles of this form here. So each exchange leads to a series of poles with a specific residues. And here, uh, these three point function are in principle unknown and we don't know them. So these cubic couplings are unknown, but all this structure is actually known for each exchange operator. And in addition, super conformal word identities act also very nicely in Melina space. So they act as some shift operator which shifts S and T, but by plus minus one, et cetera, and multiplies by powers of sigma and tau. And this operator acting on the Melin amplitude is equal to zero. So an idea, which is already a much better idea than uh, to try to use directly the defective action, is to bypass defective action and to require one, two, and three to see how much one plus two plus three constrain, constrain the answer. So we have some analyticity properties here uh, with poles, with some residues, we have crossing symmetry, etc. And this is a, is a much better idea. And indeed, it turns out that with this case, for any a case like for any values of k1, k2, k3, k4, with not that some little effort, one can produce results uh, in a case by case uh, basis. And with all these results in a case by case, it is in principle to try to guess an answer, and that was done by Rastelli and Show. Uh, but this still is not fully satisfactory. And the reason basically it is that it is very hard to generalize to other cases, which is what we would eventually uh, want to do. So if we want to do this, we actually need a new idea. So this new idea is the idea of uh, considering maximally R symmetry violating amplitudes and it is as follows. So recall that each operator depends on a four dimensional point X here, X1, X2, X3, X4, and a six dimensional null vector Y as shown here. What we are going to do now, we are going to choose a configuration where Y1 and Y3 are aligned. This configuration, if you go back to the definition of the R symmetry cross ratios, sorry, uh, to the R symmetry cross ratios, if you align Y1 and Y3, because they are null, sigma would be equal to zero and tau would be equal to one. So aligning Y1 and Y3 corresponds to taking sigma equals zero and tau equals one. So we define the MRV amplitude as the amplitude where sigma has been set to zero and tau has been set to one. The reason why we do this 
will be clear in a minute, but the honest answer is we tried a lot of things for two months and this was the thing that uh, worked really well. So yeah, so in physics, progress is usually like that. And what one can already see is that this suppresses all supergravity exchanges in the U channel because all these exchanges are proportional to Y1 dot Y3. And it turns out that the amplitude simplifies drastically in this limit. So just as an example, uh, le let me show this to you. So this is a copy paste from Mathematica and is the four point function in the simplest case, two, 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 two. So here all the k's are equal to two. So this corresponds to the stress tensor multiplet four point function, the scalar of the stress tensor multiplet in a DS five crosses five. And you see that indeed it is a mess in ST, et cetera. Then you have to imagine you start with two, 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 two. Then you go to two, two, three, three. It's another horrible mess. Three, 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 three. Bigger. It's like two pages in Mathematica. And then you have to guess the form, the generic form. It is uh, kind of hopeless. But then if you take the MR MRV limit, the amplitude reduces to this. So if you set sigma to zero and tau to one, the answer, it is, it is just uh, that answer over there. This was very nice. It, it surprised us. But then what is even nicer is to try to understand why the answer is so simple. And we see two features uh, in this answer. So the first feature, sorry, I should use the mouse. The first feature is that this has no poles in the U channel. So the full answer has no poles in the U channel. And that has to do with the fact that, um, as I told you, there is no exchanges in the U channel because they are proportional to Y1 dot Y3. But in addition, there is also a double zero in U, U minus four, u minus six for this particular case. This is a slightly harder to explain, but it has to do with the fact that in this MRV limit, some unprotected operators are also not exchanged. So the exchange of some unprotected operators is also suppressed. And the beautiful thing about this structure is that the presence of a double zero and the lack of poles in the U channel is true for any amplitude K1, K2, K3, K4. So for any amplitude in ADS5 crosses five, for any correlator, these two features in the MRV limit are true. But then one thinks, okay, this is very nice. What does this imply at the level of Witten diagrams? And it turns out that at the level of Witten diagrams, this is highly non-trivial. It's not at all obvious why this has to be the case. But if one implies this, this imposes an infinite set of constraints for all cubic couplings in these uh, Witten diagrams. Meaning that in this, which I told you these coefficients were actually unknown, if one requires the presence of double zero in the MRV limit, all these exchanges survive and you get an infinite set of constraints for these uh, cubic couplings. And these constraints are so powerful that actually in the MR MRV limit, they allow to simply write down the full amplitude for all K1, K2, K3, and K4. This is already very cool. But what is even more cool is that actually we can now use our symmetry in order to get the full sigma and tau dependence. Remember that we MRV limit is defined as the limit where sigma is equal to zero and tau is equal to one. But what is nice is that you can now use this SO6 symmetry to restore the full sigma and tau dependence. And from this, we get the answer 
for all k1, k2, k3, k4, for strings, uh, for correlators uh, on n equals four super animals. So let, let me show you the answer. So the answer has the following form. So actually we have found a representation where contact terms are actually absent. So in principle, one could imagine that you could act contact terms, but you can show using the word identities that for this representation, contact terms are not there. We have the sum of three terms, S channel plus T channel plus U channel, where each of these is a sum over poles, in this case, finite number of poles for any K1, K2, K3, K4, where the residue we can explicitly give and compute. So this solves a 20 year old problem. It gives a compact and explicit expression for all supergravity amplitudes. And in particular, uh, well, and for this case, the case I discussed here, uh, proves the results by Rastelli and so. But actually there is something more and is that one can go to these examples where we don't know the effective action, like strings on EDS7 crosses four, sorry, M theory on EDS7 crosses four or EDS4 crosses seven. These are dual to three dimensional theories or the 60 to comma zero theory. One can again use the method I just explained. And again, we compute all the amplitudes in those cases too. So this method works for, uh, for all these examples, ADS seven crosses four, ADS five crosses five, and ADS four crosses seven. Fernando, yes. there's a question in the chat by Alex Belin. What yes. about ADS three times S three? Yes, so this is a little bit different and uh, because in that case, the theory is two dimensional. And um, I, yeah, so, so th this is a bit different. So, so we would have to think about this and, and uh, in that case, you have different kind of operators. And I think something like this could be useful, but it doesn't fall in this category because the CFT is a bit different. So here, basically, we discuss uh, all theories with 16 supercharges, which are maximally supersymmetric in dimensions higher than two. So the CFT, so this does not uh, include the DS3 cross S3. Alex, feel free to unmute yourself and, and ask your question. Sorry, I wasn't sure if I could. Uh, I arrived a bit late. Hi, Fernando. Uh, but somehow one would think that for 2D CFTs, it should be even easier somehow. Yeah, but, but you, you have to be careful because there are like these sigma, sigma bar operators. So you need to consider, but, but I agree. I, I think something like this should be possible. And, and it is one of the things that we, we are uh, about to discuss. Yeah. Thanks. Very good. See you uh, here tomorrow, Alex. <laughs> Yeah, but, but this is for CFTs in dimensions higher than two. Good. So in the last five minutes, uh, or six, maybe seven minutes, so, okay, five. <laughs> well, I got one question that you give me one minute of, uh, of extra time. And uh, we will discuss now the scattering of gluons uh, in this context. Let's scatter gluons. Now, in a string theory, if you want gluons, what we mean by gluons are open strings. And if you want to have open strings, then you need to add brains to, to this construction. So we have open strings that start and end on these uh, D brains. So what we are going to do, we are going to add, so there, is, there, are, there, is, uh, there are different constructions. But the simplest construction to discuss in this talk is where you take ADS5 crosses five and you add D7 brains. This was very popular um, a, a couple of decades ago in the context of ADS CFT with flavors. And what you do is you add M, where M is a small number, uh, it doesn't have to be large, M, D7 brains that wrap the ADS5 and an S3 inside the S5. Of course, as you add these T7 brains, 
you break the symmetry a little bit. And now, rather than n equals four super Yan mills, we get n equals two super Yan mills with flavors. And the SO6 that before corresponded to the S5, now is broken because the D7 brains wrap an S3 and it goes to SO4 cross SO2. And um, this is the isometry group of the S3, and this is the perpendicular space. And this SO4, you can write it down as SU to left cross SU to right, and this is like a U1, and this is the famous uh, R symmetry group of 4D n equals 2. Now, since we have these open strings, uh, this can be seen as the fact that this global flavor symmetry gives rise to a spin one current multiplet that before we didn't have. And we uh, match gluons on a DS to the protected scalar operator, which happens to have dimension two, in this current multiplet of n equals two uh, super Yan mills. And because we have the S3, we all again have this Kalusa Klein tower of S3 modes, and this corresponds to a tower of a scalar operators of dimension K. So we have very much the situation as before, but instead of having the stress tensor multiplet, we have these current multiplets, uh, the current multiplet and generalization to higher K. Uh, sorry, I, I will try to be, uh, to be a bit brief, but having uh, indices, so this copies very much what we did before for the case of closed strings, but now the operators, they transform in the adjoint representation of this uh, flavor group, SUM, because it is an open string starting and ending on the brain. And in addition, it transforms, it has K indices in, uh, for SU to right and K minus two indices for SU to left. And very much as before, instead of carrying all these nasty indices, we can introduce two, in this case, two um, spinners, V and V bar, and we can define these operators, which are now a function of the space-time point and uh, two spinners. I, I am running out of time, but I will finish uh, quite quickly. Uh, so the observable now, it is a function of four, of these operators. Each operator, remember, has an adjoint index with respect to this SUM, and uh, it depends on a space-time point and these two uh, spinners, V and V bar, which are simply SU2 spinners that we have used to define the operator. And because of the bosonic part of the, of the group, it is given by a standard prefactor, very much as before, and this function here, which is a function of the two cross ratios and the two R symmetry cross ratios. Well, one would be the R symmetry SU to R and the other is this global SU to left, alpha and beta. But notice now that we don't have a symmetry between alpha and beta because we have K indices in alpha and K minus two in this V bar. So this is a polynomial of the degree K in alpha and the degree K minus two in beta, where alpha and beta are defined uh, like this. Very much as before, we have a uh, super conformal word identities. And naively now, because we have n equals two instead of n equals four, it looks like super conformal word identities are only half as powerful but because we have independent flavor structures, we have that these word identities are satisfied for every independent flavor structures. And very like, luckily, this ends up being powerful enough to solve the problem we want to solve. So again, the idea is, is a straightforward. So we would like, we are interested in three level amplitudes which are given by this diagram that I uh, drew here, but on a DS5 cross S3. And it turns out that to lead in order, 
in one over n, the exchange of gravitons, I will show the diagrams uh, later on, is actually suppressed. So we only have the exchange of these gluons and the generalizations of the gluons. And again, we can consider this MRV limit that we considered before. Now we don't have sigma and tau, we have only alpha. So the MRV limit is simply alpha equals zero. But uh, quite nicely in the MRV limit, we still have uh, a set of non-trivial constraints. So what happens is that we have again, no poles in U and again, one zero uh, in U. Now one instead of two, because we have N equals two instead of N equals four. Okay, so one, okay, one more minute. And uh, then um, again, this gives a set of powerful constraints. And again, sorry, I am not showing too much the details, but I will be happy to discuss them uh, afterwards. And the point is that again, we can compute fully the MRV answer. And again, we can use our symmetry to get the full answer from it. So this will be my last slide, technical slide before the conclusions. So the structure of the answer is exactly this, is the sum of three terms. The full uh, color dependence comes through these factors, CS, CT, and CU, given by this, where these Fs are the structure constants. And these functions here are explicitly given and computed. So this structure is very much like the structure of three level amplitudes in flat space. So it is very nice to get them in ADS. And again, we have found a representation where contact terms are absent. And the last thing I will say is that what is super nice is that actually the same method works for a variety of theories in four, five, six, and three dimensions, as I list here. So basically, with this method, uh, we have now all three level amplitudes in a variety of maximally and half maximally supersymmetric conformal field theories in three, four, five, and six dimensions. This encodes a wealth of CST data and um, interesting problems for the future are to consider loops and gravitational interactions, which I try to, to draw here. And a good question is, try to compute higher point functions now and ask how much of the beautiful structure present in flat space is present also in ADS. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fernando. So are there questions? Okay, there is one question. Hi, thanks, Fernando, for the nice talk. Um, I have questions about this uh, the actual rules you use. Yes. So let me start from the last one. So you said that with our symmetry, you could restore the sigma. Yes. Data. Yes. So let me. But our symmetry, I mean, the sigma sorry. tau are already our symmetry. Sorry. SO6 invariant. I think you also said that you could recover with SO6. Yes. So they are already SO6 invariant. So oh, so, sorry. So, uh, so the, the MR, MRB limit. So let me explain more in detail. So the MRV, MRV limit corresponds to taking sigma equals zero and tau equals one. Now, you know that the answer, um, you can decompose the answer in terms of SO6 polynomials because of, the, because of the, the, the symmetry. And what happens is that each one of the SO6 polynomials survives in the limit sigma to zero and, and tau equals one. And now you can basically, uh, once you get, uh, so, so basically the answer is a linear combination of these SO6 polynomials with some coefficients, but given the answer already in the MRV limit, you can compute what, what these coefficients are in front of the SO6 polynomials. You can separate the answer into the that, that That's right, yeah. And what, so what I should add, some, because, I, because of time limits, I couldn't say this, something that you cannot fix uh, naively is the regular part. 
So you can fix all the polar part of the answer. But then given our representation, the representation I, I gave here, you can use the word identities to check that the regular part is actually zero. So you can fix the polar part of the full answer, and then you have to use the word identities again to check that the regular part is, is zero in, in this representation. But it depends very much on the representation, of course, because if here you shift this by some ST and U, uh, because ST and U are dependent, you have to pick the right representation. Okay, so we have a question from Ufa Haroni. Yes. Uh, I also want to just say that there, there'll be an um, opportunity to interact with the speakers in the in the breaks, even for the remote people. But Ufa, please uh, go ahead. Hi, Fernando. Uh, so uh, do, do you know if the loop amplitudes also simplify significantly in this MRV limit? Uh, yeah, I mean, th th that's a very good question, actually. And um, the, 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 well, <laughs> I, I don't know the answer because we haven't computed too many loop amplitudes. So like the only loop, um, well, it's not super clear. And the reason why it's not super clear is because one doesn't simply have exchanges, but, but it has more than exchanges as, as you know very well. So because of that, I am not entirely sure that whether I would expect uh, a big simplification. I wouldn't expect it, but, but uh, it's worth uh, actually having a look. So we have one final question from Matthias Gabadil. Thanks. So, so what about higher point amplitudes? Is there an MRV type trick that you can? Yeah. Obviously, you have to choose a little bit more, right? I mean, you yeah. Have to so restrict the kinematical setup more, so it simplifies. But then the question is it, that that's right. So, so the the thing. So here, although the, yeah, that's a super good question. Here, there are actually three MRV limits, which are the S channel, T channel, and U channel MRV limits, where you may coincide, let's say, Y one with Y two or Y one with Y three or with Y4. Um, for five-point functions, you will have more possibilities. And the question is, uh, we, we do expect some simplification, but for the four-point function, one MRV limit was enough. I think for five-point functions, one will have to take different MRV limits and use all of them. And uh, yeah, I, I mean, what we were expecting, or what our dream, would be something like this Park Taylor formula for this MRV uh, for MRV now limit. Yeah. So we are considering we are looking at five and six point functions at the moment. Okay. Then I would uh, suggest you thank Fernando again for a very nice presentation. Thank you.